Good afternoon, everybody. We're just waiting for the attendees to stream in, and then we will begin once I see that number settle down. Wonderful, so we'll begin. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Bill O'Hearn. I'm the Director of Development uh, here at Claire. Um, I'm at Claire this afternoon. It is very quiet, I'm sad to say. Um, the bell next door at King's should be ringing for even song, and it is not, uh, because Cambridge is much too quiet. But it is an honor to welcome you all here tonight to join Toby Wilkinson and Paul Cartledge, um, two fabulous uh, members of the fellowship great authors, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them in a moment. Um, but I should say that we had planned to do this uh, gathering last week in London at uh, Pitt's Hanger House, um, and it was going to be a, a splendid evening uh, to celebrate their, their two new books, but I'm pleased that we're able to reschedule and do it here. We're recording this webinar this evening. Um, if uh, you have questions that occur to you, please uh, put them in the chat function. So click chat, type in your question, hit return, and we will collect those for the ends of, end of the talk. So we're gonna hear from uh, Toby first and then from Paul, and then we'll have some Q&A. And this is being recorded. So if you have to leave and you wanna watch some more of it later, or if you wanna share it with friends, you'll have a chance to do that. So Professor Toby Wilkinson is a bi fellow of Claire and Deputy Chancellor and Professor of Egyptology at the University of Lincoln, acclaimed by the Daily Telegraph uh, as the foremost Egyptologist of his time. He is a New York Times bestseller uh, and uh, prize winning author of 12 books that have been translated into 12 languages. His new book published this October is being given its world premiere showcase today at our digital gala week. Um, I should also say that uh, Toby is uh, my predecessor here at Claire, and I'm reminded every day what big shoes I have to fill. He did a great job. Paul Cartledge uh, is uh, the A.G. Leventis Senior Research Fellow of, of Claire and Emeritus A.G. Leventis Professor of Greek Culture in the Faculty of Classics. Uh, Thebes, ancient Greek Thebes, has too often been forgotten, and if not completely forgotten, uh, 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 and not given its due, is one of the great cities of ancient Greece and so of the world. Actually, it was two cities, the city of myth, uh, from, uh, for which remember Oedipus and Antigone and company, uh, who still feature centrally in, in plays and operas, and the city of history, the city that developed a federal system of regional government at home and spread abroad, not only of federalism, but of liberation too. In his lecture, Paul says he hopes to give some inkling of the riches to be found in his book, Thebes, the Forgotten City of Ancient Greece, published last month by Picador. Um, I urge you to Google it. It's gotten some fabulous reviews and I'm sure Paul would be pleased if you were to order it too on Amazon. So welcome Toby and welcome Paul and we're gonna begin with Toby. Thank you very much, Bill. It's great to be here. And uh, as Bill said, my, my book, well, it was due to have been published uh, in, in April, but like so many things, uh, it's been postponed to the autumn. But I'm absolutely delighted to be sharing uh, a world premiere sneak preview uh, with members and friends of Claire uh, this afternoon. So let us begin. The rediscovery of ancient Egypt uh, in largely by the West began with Napoleon's expedition to Egypt in 1798. And for the next 120 years unfolded through a series of exploits by adventurers and archeologists digging beneath the sands of the Nile Valley. I'm gonna share with you this afternoon just five little vignettes of that amazing story uh, taken from my new book, A World Beneath the Sands. And we'll start with a little quiz. What do these five things have in common? 
the Zodiac of Paris. The German, or I should say Prussian, oceanographer and polymath, Alexander von Humboldt. Verdi's opera, Aida. The National Trust. And Downton Abbey, otherwise known as Highclere Castle. Well, the answer is that all five of them played a part in that rediscovery story of ancient Egypt. And I want to share with you just a few little excerpts this evening to whet your appetite. And you'll notice that these are selected to represent 25 year intervals uh, in that story, starting exactly 200 years ago in 1820. And as I mentioned, the, the story of the uncovering of, of ancient Egypt's great civilization starts with uh, Napoleon Bonaparte and his expedition to Egypt in 1798. And many of you may know uh, the outcome of that, which was that uh, Napoleon's forces were beaten by Nelson uh, at the Battle of the Nile. And the antiquities that Napoleon's savant, his, his scholars, had amassed in Egypt over the two or three years of the French occupation, well, most of them became uh, the spoils of war and found their way not to the Louvre, uh, but to the British Museum. And that included uh, most famously the Rosetta Stone, which of course would prove key to the decipherment of hieroglyphics. Well, as you can imagine, the, the French were somewhat miffed, uh, to put it mildly, that the antiquities that they had so carefully excavated and studied uh, were taken to London and not to glorify uh, Republican France. And so it was uh, that once the Napoleonic expedition had been published uh, in a great series of folio volumes called the Description of Egypt, the Description de l'Egypte, a, a momentum built in Paris and in France to acquire really significant antiquities for the Louvre. Uh, to show that France was every bit the equal uh, of Britain. And in 1820, 200 years ago, a plan was hatched to seize one of the prize antiquities of ancient Egypt and bring it back to the Louvre. And that prize antiquity was the Zodiac. The Zodiac had been first uh, spotted on the roof of the Temple of Hathor at Dendera uh, by Napoleon's expedition. Uh, and it had been coveted by the French ever since. And when the expedition finally set sail for Egypt in, in 1821, its goal was very simple and, and, and very straightforward, which was to hack the Zodiac from the roof uh, of that temple uh, and bring it safely back to Paris. And that was done despite the protestations of the, of the English agent, Henry Salt, uh, and it did indeed find its way uh, to Paris where it became an instant success uh, and a great talking point across the French city. And there was in fact only one French voice that was raised in opposition uh, to that uh, seizure of the Zodiac. Uh, and that was by the gentleman on the right of the slide here. And uh, he wrote uh, an anonymous letter uh, to a French newspaper uh, in October 1821 as the Zodiac was being unveiled in Paris. Uh, and, and he wrote this, we applaud the patriotic sentiments which guided this, our two compatriots bold project carried out so skillfully and successfully. But in congratulating Monsieur Saulnier and Le Lorrain, on having so carefully transported the circular zodiac of Dendera from the banks of the Nile to those of the Seine and not the Thames, we cannot, however, refrain from expressing a certain regret that this magnificent temple has been deprived of one of its finest monuments. Should we in France follow the example of Lord Elgin? Certainly not. Well, the writer of that review was none other than Jean-Francois Champollion, who just a year later, a year after writing that review, made the great breakthrough, the decipherment of hieroglyphics, ironically, 
based not on the Zodiac of Paris, but on the Rosetta Stone in London. Um, and so established himself really as the founding figure uh, of Egyptology. But that episode really kick-started a long-running feud, a rivalry between France and Britain uh, over the spoils of ancient Egypt, which lasted throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. But they weren't the only two European powers in on the game of rediscovering and acquiring uh, the ancient world to suit their current political pretensions. Uh, Prussia, particularly under its king Friedrich Wilhelm IV, uh, wanted a slice of the action too, and wanted to beautify and enrich uh, the Prussian capital at Berlin to stand comparison with London and Paris. And this is where Alexander von Humboldt comes into the story, because it was he who had the ear of the king who persuaded Friedrich Wilhelm IV to launch a Prussian expedition to Egypt uh, in the 1840s. And the man chosen for the task uh, was uh, this gentleman here, Carl Richard Lepsius, um, who prepared what is undoubtedly the most ambitious and the best uh, provisioned expedition ever to travel to Egypt. And uh, it was not without its moments of national pride also. Here is a wonderful illustration from uh, the official account of the, the, the Prussian expedition, which shows Lepsius and his uh, co-conspirators, if I can call them that, unfurling the Prussian eagle on top of the Great Pyramid of Giza. And he also installed a, a, an, ex, an inscription composed in hieroglyphics extolling the virtues of the Prussian king. Probably the first extensive inscription to be written in hieroglyphics uh, for some 2,000 years. But just a little insight into how these early expeditions uh, unfolded in Egypt is provided by Lepsius's journal. And I just wanted to read you a brief extract to give you a flavor of what life was like excavating beneath the sands uh, of, of Egypt. So let me read you a little extract from my book, um, and then it concludes with uh, a piece from Lepsius's own, uh, own diary. So he's working at Giza, and in the first few months of the expedition, it was visited by a succession of disasters, some of them almost biblical in scale. First, a sudden rainstorm and flash flood destroyed the camp, washing away belongings into the muddy, foam-covered, slimy lake. Our books, our drawings, sketches, linen, instruments of all kinds. Dripping wet, the men had to wade waist deep to retrieve their positions, possessions. Then a few weeks later, a swarm of locusts ravaged the country for miles around. The following month, an armed mob attacked the camp one night, plundering it for anything of monetary value. Lepsius was sanguine, recording, none of our party was seriously injured and nothing that is irreparable was lost. The affair therefore is over and the consequences may only prove a useful lesson to us. But he nonetheless summed up the trials and tribulations some suffered by the expedition in just its first six months in these words. It appears that we are to have a taste of all the plagues of Egypt. Our experience began with the inundation of the Great Pyramids. Then came the locusts, which combined with the previous cattle disease is indeed sufficient to cause a famine. Then occurred the hostile attack, which was preceded by a daring robbery. Nor has even a conflagration been found wholly wanting. By an incautious salute, Wilde's tent was set on fire and partly burned in Saqqara. Now comes in addition to this, the annoyance of mice. They gnaw, play and squeak away in my tent. During the night, they run over my bed and over my face. In spite of all these annoyances, however, we continue to keep up a good and cheerful spirit. And I can say that life on an excavation in Egypt hasn't changed entirely since the 1840s, although I've never had mice running over my face at night. Well, of course, once Lepsius brought back his hoard of treasures for the Berlin Museum, uh, it was time for the French to feel uh, a little nose out of joint again. 
And so in the 1850s, they sent another expedition to Egypt to bolster the collections of the Louvre. And that was headed by this man, uh, Auguste Mariette, uh, who goes down as one of the greats of Egyptian archaeology. You can see here he adopted the, the styles of dress of the Egyptians, uh, and he discovered the Serapium at Saqqara and a whole host of other monuments. And in fact, he was such a successful archaeologist uh, that he was appointed by the Egyptian uh, Khedive to be the first director of the Egyptian Museum and head of the Egyptian Antiquities Service, which remained in French hands until the 1950s. And here's just a selection of the objects that he found and spirited uh, back to the Louvre. But of course, he did also set up an Egyptian museum uh, and became quite uh, determined later in life uh, that the patrimony of Egypt should not leave the Nile Valley, but should be preserved for future generations of Egyptians uh, to enjoy. Perhaps Mariette's greatest triumph was the opening of the Suez Canal, another great French project. Uh, in 1869, when he personally escorted uh, Empress uh, uh, Eugenie of France uh, on, her, uh, on her yacht during the ceremonies to, to open uh, the, the Suez Canal and, and on a tour of Egypt later. And part of the original celebrations planned for the opening of the Suez Canal uh, was to have been a great performance in Cairo's new opera house. And Mariette had been uh, hired to write the libretto of what would become the opera Aida. But he was so uh, overwhelmed with the work of running the antiquities service and the museum uh, that he was late in that piece of homework. And so it wasn't Aida which opened the Suez Canal, but Verdi's Rigoletto instead. Uh, and in fact, uh, Aida carried on being written through 1870 and received its first performance. Uh, in 1871. But Egypt remains grateful to Mariette, though he was a Frenchman, for founding Egypt's National Museum. And here is Mariette's tomb in the grounds of the Cairo Museum uh, with the wonderful inscription, L'Egypte reconnaissante, a grateful Egypt. Well, moving on to 1895, what's the National Trust connection, which is celebrating its 125th anniversary this year? Well, it's the extraordinary um, meeting of these two Victorian gentlemen. Here is Canon Hardwick Rawnsley, founder of the National Trust in 1895. Uh, and here is his uh, contemporary, uh, Sir William Flinders Petrie. Well, they may look similar in terms of their, their facial hair, uh, but they were very far from being similar in terms of temperament. Canon Hardwick Rawnsley was a a rather stiff upper lip uh, Anglican clergyman. Um, Flinders Petrie was a great iconoclast. And when he went to Egypt to excavate, he liked to do things uh, in a pretty relaxed manner. He, you see him outside a, a rock cut tomb on his first visit uh, to Egypt in 1880 with a, a pretty scruffy old suit on. And here he is at the center of the picture on one of his excavations with a sort of towel over his head. And again, in, in very unkempt clothing. And he used to make a virtue of, of being as, as disheveled as possible because he said it scared away the tourists. Uh, and sometimes indeed, he took to excavating in his pink underwear, uh, hoping that tourists would mistake him for a naked man uh, and run screaming from the site. But these two uh, worlds of, of Victorian respectability and uh, a dirty old dig collided when Canon Rawnsley visited uh, Petrie on one of his excavations uh, just after the founding of the National Trust. And he was so impressed evidently that he sent his son, Noel Rawnsley, to work as a volunteer with Petrie during a subsequent season. Um, and here is uh, Noel Rawnsley's account uh, of his experience on a Petrie dig. First came an ice cold bath. Visions, visions of ham and eggs are lost in the reality of other food. We sit on empty boxes to discuss our meals. The dining room is floored with sand. It is an oblong room and down its center is a rough trestle table. The boards are somewhat warped and stained and on them range the bowls of food or open tins covered with dishes or saucers to exclude the dust. 
Along each side wall is a single plank for shelf where lie the records of the excavations, a few odd finds, the public ink and pens and rolls of copied hieroglyphs. Well, that could be bad enough, but in fact, um, he was so uh, ascetic, Petrie, in, in his attitude to provisions, that he generally speaking uh, served tins of food dug up from the previous season. And he would test each tin before opening it by throwing it against the stone wall of the camp. And if it survived without exploding, its contents were deemed fit for consumption. So it was not exactly a walk in the park excavating uh, on a peat tree dig. But in later life, he became the grand old man of, of Egyptology, left his collections to University College London, where they're still displayed in the Petrie Museum, and is recognized today as one of the greatest excavators uh, of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But as I say, it wouldn't have been much fun working on one of his digs. And then the final vignette takes us to 100 years ago, to 1920, uh, and to the subject of aristocrats uh, and archaeologists. There weren't, I think, any archaeologists in the series Downton Abbey, uh, but there might well have been, because, of course, uh, Highclere Castle, where it was filmed, is the ancestral seat uh, of the Earls of Carnarvon. And here is the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, uh, George Herbert, who rather famously uh, in 1907 uh, met up with uh, his archaeologist, Howard Carter, uh, to form an extraordinary partnership. Well, it's, it's not often realized that Carter and Carnarvon excavated for many, many years uh, in the hills uh, of Thebes, searching for uh, a lost tomb. They started work in the season of 1908. Then, of course, along came the First World War, which halted excavations for a number of years. Carter started again in 1917. And you know, by 1922, had had five fruitless seasons excavating in the heat and dust of the Valley of the Kings. And not even uh, the Earl of Carnarvon's funds were uh, inexhaustible, and he was starting to give up all hope, but agreed reluctantly to one final season of excavation, which began in October 1922. Uh, Carter arrived on the 28th of October uh, and digging began just a few days later. Um, and only three days into the dig, they uncovered that flight of steps leading down into the bedrock, which of course led to the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. The greatest discovery uh, in the history of archeology, span a discovery which really set the seal and, and formed the culmination uh, of that heroic age of Egyptology that began uh, with Napoleon's expedition. And, and a discovery which quite literally yielded uh, a world beneath the sands. So that's a, a quick canter through uh, my new book. Um, and of course, it starts and finishes uh, in Egyptian Thebes, uh, the realm of the dead, uh, and the great city of the pharaohs. But there was another Thebes in the ancient world. Um, and for that story, I shall turn to my friend and colleague, Professor Paul Cartledge. Paul, over to you. So Toby, if you could stop sharing your screen, that will permit Paul to share his. There we go. Okay. Paul, unmute. Paul, we need you to unmute, I'm afraid. Paul? 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 Oh dear. There we go. We can now hear you, Paul. <laughs> 
<laughs> so sorry, everybody. I am technologically extremely challenged. Is this all right now, Bill, for me to go ahead? So Toby, you did an absolutely terrific job. It's a very hard act uh, to follow you, but uh, I'm very honored to follow my friend. And as Toby said right at the end, the, the hills of Thebes, and oh, my heart sank, because of course Thebes in Egypt is the one that uh, more people have heard of than my Thebes. However, why is Egyptian Thebes called Thebes? and not waset, which it was in Egyptian. Well, because the Greeks gave a name to that city and the name they gave was Thebes and they had their own Thebes, the difference being that the Egyptian one allegedly had 100 gates, whereas the Theban one had only seven gates. So. One of the problems that I had when confronting, when thinking about writing my book, which came out, as Bill said, at the end of May, was how to persuade people that there is another Thebes that is just as interesting, if not more interesting, in some ways than the Egyptian one, at any rate. Now, you notice on the screen that I put in the subtitle Lost City of Ancient Greece. Well, that is actually my original subtitle, but it sounded too extreme to my publishers. So we substituted for Lost Forgotten. And it was actually lost for 20 whole years. In other words, a city existed, actually several cities, but at one period in the late fourth century BC, that city was physically almost completely annihilated. So actually my original title is not entirely inaccurate, but for the most part, Thebes tends to be forgotten, partly because of Egypt, and partly, sadly, because of two other major cities of ancient Greece, namely one that I spent many, many years of my career trying to resurrect, Sparta. I'm an honorary citizen of modern Sparta for my efforts. And on the other hand, of course, more famously, even than Sparta in some cultural ways, Athens. So Thebes, which is terribly important at various points, actually at one point, the most important city in ancient Greece, tended to get squeezed in terms of evidence and survival and memory between Sparta and Athens in Greece and between Egypt and Greece in terms of Greek Thebes as against Egyptian Thebes. So, as uh, Bill kindly said, I regard Thebes, my Thebes, as having really two kinds of aspects. They're actually a city of history, city of myth. So I'm going to kick off more with the city of history, then I'm going to introduce a bit of, a bit of the city of myth, then I'm going to go back to the city of history and so on. We'll have a kind of dialogue. And sometimes, of course, the two come together, myth, history. And so Thebes is sometimes presented, preserved, commemorated in myth historical terms. So we'll, if I can uh, move the slides okay, I shall, hang, hang on, that's going a little bit fast. So sorry, to, I'm going too fast for you. I have to go back. So sorry. There we go, that's a better system. So very quickly, we're in the Aegean part of the Eastern Mediterranean. And this is uh, broadly speaking, what we call old Greece, as opposed to the new Greece that expands west northeast and eventually thanks to Alexander the Great's conquests as far east as Afghanistan, Pakistan. So the Greek world, Hellas, is a very much larger area than this Aegean Greek world, but I'm just focusing on this for the sake of simplicity. So where is Thebes? Thebes lies in, as you can see from the heightened red on your left, in central Greece. And the area just to the south and east of that is the area controlled by Athens. 
Attica and the near island uh, south of mainland and central Greece is the Peloponnese wherein Sparta lies. So Thebes lies to the northwest of Athens. It's about 90 kilometers there, 55 odd miles, and it lies to the north and northeast slightly of Sparta. This is a closer up view, and we've now started off, uh, it's actually technically prehistory, but I'm gonna call it proto-history, early history, if you like, before the Thebes of history, which I'm mainly focusing on in my book, but we're going back to the late Bronze Age, as you see on your screen, I hope, Mycenaean Greece, and Mycenae is underlined in the Northeast Peloponnese, because that was the most important city then of 15th, 14th, 13th century uh, Greece. Now we speak of it as Greece because we now know that the Mycenaeans, which is a generic term, they weren't actually, they didn't call themselves Mycenaeans, but that they spoke and wrote a very early form of Greek, and that is Linear B, which I'm going to come back to shortly. Move your eyes up from Mycenae through across the isthmus into the central Greek area, and you come to Thebes, roughly in the center of Boeotia, which is the territory of which Thebes became the principal city. But you'll notice just above and to the northwest, or Komenos is underlined there. Well, already in our earliest literary source, which is of course Homer and Homer's Iliad, there is reference to both those cities as being important in the region of Boeotia, which is represented as the second most important, the most economically rich and developed region of Greece after the region dominated by Mycenae down in the Peloponnese. So already in the 1200s, Thebes is a big deal. Already it has though a rival on the other side of there's a lake there called Lake Copais. And actually the history of Boeotia as between Thebes and Orkomenos is going to play out in rivalry down to, and then from the sixth century BC onwards, Thebes takes off. It unites all of Boeotia under it. It becomes the single most important city of Boeotia politically as well as economically and in other ways. So I mentioned that in the 13th century, uh, Thebes was a major Mycenaean center. It had a palace on the Acropolis of Thebes, which was the Acropolis then, it's the Acropolis today. It has a, a name which derives actually from myth. And the name of the Acropolis is the Cadmaia, the place founded by Cadmos. And Thebes is rather strange in Greek terms. You'd think a Greek city would have been founded by a Greek. Wrong in the case of Thebes, or rather in the case of the myth history of Thebes, Cadmos was a Phoenician. Cadmos, that is, came from what's today Lebanon, from Tyre, and he came over to Greece, mainland Greece, because his sister Europa, who gives her name to Europe, even though she was an Asiatic, she <laughs> gives her name to Europe, a certain god called Zeus took a fancy to her and, well, the polite term is seized her, but actually and raped her, uh, grabbed her, took her over to mainland Greece, and Cadmos went after her and after Zeus, rescued her and decided to settle down. And so he founded the city of Thebes, sowed, this is myth, dragon's teeth in the soil, up sprang a bunch of warriors. They were the first citizens or inhabitants of Thebes, this is myth. And Thebes was surrounded by very powerful walls and their myth shades over into history. Well, the rulers of Thebes in the 13th century had a big palace, they had an administrative staff. Their basis, their economic basis, was, as you can see on this uh, slide, uh, a combination of agriculture through cereal agriculture, grain uh, growing, and wool. And the locals were forced to surrender a certain amount of their crop centrally to the palace 
palace recorded what they presented and then the palace redistributed. It was a form of redistributed economy and power based on a king, what the Greeks called a wanax, before they called their kings Basilius. Anybody called Basil has a royal name. So there is one of these clay tablets on which the transaction is recorded. They were accidentally burned when the palace was burned. And so that's the end, by and large, I'm simplifying, of Bronze Age, late Bronze Age, Mycenaean Thebes. The palace is destroyed about 1200 BC. There's then a hiatus. And so before we leave the uh, Bronze Age Mycenaean period, I introduced to you one icon, an icon in Greek means image, and therefore it should be confined if we use the word iconic properly to describing images. And this is on a, an ivory, elephant ivory toilet box that's almost certainly belonged to a woman as opposed to a man. And it depicts on the outside two confronted I heraldic sphinxes. Now, Sphinx is an Egyptian um, creation, creature, but in Egypt, they don't have wings. In Greece, they do. And so we see an appropriation of an Oriental motif, but Hellenized in an iconographic uh, form. Moving on now, we've lost the Bronze Age, the palace is gone, the Greek world generally has suffered a huge economic recession, fewer settlements, they're much poorer, their economic uh, repertoire is much more limited, until gradually, gradually, beginning in the 10th, 9th centuries, and now we're in the later 8th century, we're in Boeotia, we're in Thebes, and we're looking at an object that was deposited with a quite expensive um, burial altogether in Thebes. But like much other, dare I say, plunder, this object finds itself now in the British Museum. Well, what's the point of interest is you look at it and you know that the Iliad is almost being completed in its monumental form around now. You know that Greeks set off in ships, 1200 plus, many from Boeotia. This is all story relating to an alleged attack on a city which is now in northwest Turkey, overlooking the Dardanelles, the Hellespont. Well, you look at this and you see a man on your left grabbing a woman by the wrist and making as to go onto a warship. And what do you put uh, into your thoughts is, ah, oh, well, this could well be Menelaus, king of Sparta, having lost his wife, and we're looking at Paris, who stole his wife, Helen, Helen of Sparta, who becomes Helen of Troy. That's one possibility. There is another, because this was um, created originally in Attica, that is where Athens is, there is an Athenian hero, a culture hero, whom an Athenian looking at this would more, nat more naturally associate with this scene. And so is it possibly therefore uh, Theseus, mythical king of prehistoric uh, Athens, grasping the wrist of Ariadne, princess of Knossos on Crete, and taking her off, and of course, the cad that he is, he then abandons her on Naxos, where she is rescued by the god of wine, Dionysus, the Onysos. But at any rate, there are two alternative, at least two alternative explanations, but What's of interest to me is that Earth Theban thought it was worth acquiring somehow this pot, which is rather fine. It's a wine mixing bowl, kratia in Greek, and putting it or having his relatives put it into his grave with him. And I'm leading up here to trying to counteract one of the negativities about Thebes. Greek Thebes that comes from the fact that a lot of our evidence comes from Athens. The Athenians, I don't know when, but already by the end of the 6th century BC, by 500 BC, are referring snootily to all the oceans as pigs, swine, in other words, culturally extremely backward, interested only in filling their bellies rather than feeding their minds. 
artifacts. And so there is a series of artifacts, works of art in different forms, created by Thebans, by Boeotians, which are very strongly uh, refutes or at any rate contradicts that negative image. And I start off with uh, an image of a rather fine solid bronze, um, lost wax method, dedicated by a man called Manticlos, the inscription that you can see set out. Uh, it's rather ingeniously inscribed all around his thighs and around his groin. And you can see an image schematic of what the inscription would look like. And it says that um, it's a dedication, it's a donation to Apollo, the far shooting god, the archer god of um, health, as well as, of course, plague, which is rather sadly apt today, but also the god of poetry. And Manticlos dedicates um, this out of his gains. He's made some economic gain, and as an act of piety, he is offering this as one tenth of whatever he made his gains from. Now, that we'll never know. Likewise, in the same vein, and in the book, there is actually a rather different image uh, than this one. But this Kouros, or naked youth, like the Sphinx, is of ultimately Egyptian inspiration and origin. But what the Greeks did was take over the formula, unclothe an, an Egyptian male so that they're stark naked. The Greek word gumnos gives us our word gymnasium and gymnastics. Greek males like to show off their, shall we say, attributes. And at this one shrine, which was controlled uh, by Thebes, and it's very near Thebes, about uh, eight miles away, no fewer than 100 plus of such kuroi figures, naked youths made out of marble, life-size or over-life-size, and each one of them would have taken about a year to make. That, that's how complicated. So, so much for the Athenian sneer, Boeotian swine. Actually, some Boeotians are pretty unswinish. Well, now my next section, I'll have to go quite quickly through this, is uh, devoted to the Thebes of myth. And it's, as um, Bill said right at the beginning, it's actually the Thebes of myth that mo more impacts us still today. In other words, the legacy of ancient Greek Thebes comes ultimately from its having been a city of myth. But Although the Thebans themselves created myths, they wrote their own poetry, not that much of it has survived as such. What we have instead, mainly, uh, is quite extraordinary, is the way the Athenians, especially Athenian playwrights of the, fourth, sorry, of the 5th century BC, the 400s, and in particular, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, the big three, what they made of Theban myths for mainly, not exclusively, but Athenian audiences in their theatre of Dionysus, which could accommodate up to 15, 17,000 people in the open air. So first of all here, those of you who've seen Sophocles' Antigone, or perhaps they've seen Ennui's Antigone, you see here Antigone, daughter and also half-sister of Oedipus, before Creon, her uncle, her maternal uncle, and that's a key part of the Antigone drama, which uh, is possibly the most performed and re-performed in translation normally, of course, of all the ancient Greek tragedies today. I show you another example of now an Athenian appropriation, in this case of the Sphinx motif. This happens to be a particularly elaborate, expensive Athenian-made pottery artifact, which was then exported to South Italy, where it found its way into a very expensive grave with tons of really lovely stuff. This particular object is a write-on, that is, it's a wine pourer, and it's a attributed to the um, painter and the potter, maybe the same person, but somebody called Sotades was certainly a potter, and therefore the guy who painted this vase is known as the Sotades painter, maybe the same guy. And that just shows you how Athenians reinterpreted 
incorporated Theban myth, then exported them to Greeks living in South Italy. So Theban myth gets expanded around the uh, Mediterranean Greek world. A further example, and here we're moving on to uh, what is um, one of the probably nastiest uh, of all uh, tragedies in some ways. Uh, it involves Dionysus, it involves um, a descendant of um, Cadmos, and you see him in the middle here, a man called Pentheus, whose name is related to the Greek word for grief. And you can see him being literally torn limb from limb because the Theban originally myth is that his mum was a terrific devotee of Bacchus, of Dionysus. She got totally smashed. And in her a, a complete delirium, she thought Pentheus, her son, was a wild beast, a lion. She seized upon him with a, an assistant here called Eno and tore her son to pieces. And then when she came to, she was holding her son's head in her hands. Right, not pleasant. So you ask yourself, what was in it for the Thebans in the initial period? And then secondly, and actually it's an easier question to answer, why were Athenian dramatists and audiences so keen on representing these really quite unpleasant Theban myths of people who marry their mother having killed their father, then their sons fight it out and kill each other, sons who are also half brothers of their father. Well, I think there is one possible explanation. We humans somewhat sadly get a certain amount of, there's a German word for it, schadenfreude. We get pleasure from the disasters or the troubles of others. And so in the fifth century, when these tragedies are being uh, created and performed, Thebes and Athens were enemies. And so it was quite nice to see nasty uh, Thebans being nasty to each other on the Athenian stage. However, Thebans didn't just produce myths, they also produced brilliant musicians. And this particular pot, it's a very elaborate one depicting a scene of a chorus from a play together with the playwright of the play, the producer of the play. And the one that I'm particularly interested in is the man whose name is in the caption, Pronomos, because Pronomos was a Theban. And he was, as it were, the Jimmy Galway of his day. Round about 400 BC, he was simply the best flautist. We call the aulos a flute. Actually, it was double, as you can see, and it was reeded. So it's actually more like an oboe. But nevertheless, when you have music in a drama, and all ancient dramas, comedy, satyr drama, or uh, tragedy, they all have musical accompaniment to the poetry that is being said or sung. Well, you have to have an aulos player and pronomos was the greatest of his day. Well, his day was also the day when the Athenians and the Thebans were at each other's throats for getting on a generation. And this is the famous or infamous Peloponnesian War. That is the war of the Athenians against the Peloponnesians led by Sparta with their allies, Thebes. This is a tombstone reconstruction drawing from one of the Boeotian cities. So one of the cities that was part of the federation headed by Thebes, which took on the uh, Athenians on the side of the Spartans. Saugonese from Tarnagra probably or possibly fought and died at a famous battle which is celebrated because it's written up in great detail by the contemporary historian, who was of course an Athenian, not a Theban, uh, Thucydides. So this is a grave stele from Tanagra of the late fifth century BC. And it's a testimony, an extant memorial of that rather dreadful generation long war between the Athenians and the Spartans and their allies a war which the Spartans eventually won. However, now I'm leaping forward because time is uh, short and of the essence. 
Though Thebes was on the side of the Spartans during the Peloponnesian War, and though you would have thought Thebes would have been quite happy that the Spartans won it, the Spartans exploited their victory in ways which many of their allies, including the Thebans, not only the Spartans' enemies, thought was excessive. In other words, they became dictatorial, tyrannical, uh, imperialist in a very bad way, which meant that the Thebans, having been always up to then an ally of uh, Sparta, started to look to Sparta's uh, enemies, including in particular Athens. To cut a very long story short, in the first 40 years or so, four decades, after the Peloponnesian War, so from the end of the 5th century into the 370s uh, of the 4th century BC, there's a kind of seesawing between Sparta, Athens and Thebes. And now when Thebes is uh, with Athens, they're going to come up ahead of Sparta, then Thebes seems to get too far ahead, so Athens thinks, oh, well, maybe I'll go back to Sparta, and so a ding-dong, ding-dong. Cutting a long story short, in the 380s, the Spartans break a treaty they've themselves sworn by a religious oath. They occupy Thebes. That causes the Athenians to wish to help the Thebans to be liberated from their Spartan oppressors. That is a successful liberation. Early 370s, Thebes suddenly starts to rise up under the um, leadership of two Thebans in particular. Pelopidas and Epaminondas. Epaminondas, one of my favorite ancient Greeks uh, for all sorts of reasons. They lead Thebes into a new political military world. Thebes becomes a kind of democracy for the first time. Thebes becomes again the head of a federal state, this time a democratic federal state. Thebes acquires new forces, new types of army, develops new strategy and tactics, and wins a fantastic battle, the Battle of Leuctra in 371 BC, which, in retrospect, is the end of Sparta as a great power, not the end of Athens as a great power. Athens still has pretensions until, unfortunately for it, Athens and Thebes come up against another major power. And I'll scoot over this slide, which just shows you um, the sort of imagery that the Boeotians put on their coins when they were members of a federal state, such as I've just uh, described. And this particular example comes from the town or city of Thespiae. But this is what I wanted to um, come on to. I'm going to go quite quickly now, as I know time is running out. This is a monument symbolizing the defeat of united Thebes and Athens. Sparta is now out of the picture and they are resisting the uh, attempted takeover of all mainland Greece from a new northern power, Macedon, under its extraordinary king Philip, Philip II, father of Alexander, who becomes Alexander the Great. So this land monument symbolizes the end, as some would say, of free Greece, that is free from domination by a foreign power. Um, others would say it's the end of free Greece because it's the end really of the old type of democracy, um, primary democracy, direct democracy, the sort of thing I wrote about in my last book. And this is really the, the beginning of a new era, which we call the Hellenistic era. And I'm just going to illustrate that with one image, because Thebes was physically annihilated under the uh, regime of Alexander the Great and ceased to exist for 20 years. It was resurrected towards the end of the 4th century, before 300 BC, and life became thereafter quite comfortable. And the ladies, the women of Thebes, had a very high reputation for their looks, for the ease with which they lived, 
it, but it wasn't anything like as exciting, shall we say, as Thebes had been, or as Greek history had been for Thebes uh, before. So now a couple of final slides, we go back to mythical Thebes. Here we have a very famous painting by uh, Ang, who was, uh, among other things, Napoleon's sort of court painter, along with Jacques-Louis David. And here we have Oedipus quizzing the Sphinx, famous um, riddle. There are various versions of it. What goes on um, four legs in the morning, two in the afternoon, three in the evening? Well, it's man a baby and then an adult and then as an elderly person like myself. Well, an image of this, in other words, a copy of this painting hung on the wall in Hampstead of a certain Sigmund Freud. And so the Oedipus complex, which is still well debated, but at any rate, it's um, got a certain currency. Uh, here you see um, an image which Freud was inspired by. And finally now, dance. I'm particularly passionate about um, ballet. And here we see an image from the Ballet Russe, that's to say the company which Diaghilev founded in the early 20th century. And it modernized a classical ballet in extraordinary ways. And it's um, court painter, as it were, it's um, regular um, designer was a man called Leon Baxt, who went to Greece in 1907. And a few years after that, he designed a ballet set in Boeotia, and it was called uh, Narcisse, 1911. So on that note, sorry to have gone on much longer than I should have done, but thank you if you have been listening. Oh, thank you. Enthralling as always. Um, <laughs> so I now want to invite some questions. Um, Maybe, maybe to kick us off, um, Paul, you've published a number of books. Toby, you've published a number of books. Um, why this subject? Why now? Um, what, 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 what leads us to you know, these being your most recent books? Is it something about recent archaeological discoveries? Should I go first? Yes, it opened up. Yes. Do I well, stop sharing my screen, by the way? Yes, please do, Paul. Uh, the, the reason why I, I wrote this book um, is because it may not have escaped your notice that <clears throat> uh, uh, hieroglyphs were deciphered in 1822 uh, and the tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered in 1922. And um, <laughs> we, we're on the verge of a bicentenary and a centenary of, of those great bookends of the rediscovery of ancient Egypt. So it seemed like a natural time to tell the story of the century between the two. Very good. Shall I pitch in? Um... My, yes. my, my explanation is quite different. It's not in terms of time so much, but it's a, an attempt to recuperate um, a city which, in my opinion, had not been given its due. So it was in a way coincidence that the book came out in 2020, as it could have come out in 2010 or 2030, possibly, if um, the current trends of uh, interest in ancient history, which don't predominantly look at Thebes and its surrounding region. Very good. S switching for a second, you, you both touched on it glancingly, and I know, Paul, you're on record about some of these things, but um, talk about your views on repatriation of, of these objects that are around the, around the world and, and the good work that are being done in the national museums and you know, what your view of these debates are. Well, Bill, you probably know I'm a member of the British Committee for the Reunification of the Parthenon Marbles, and this is tying in in an extraordinary way to, uh, you might be surprised to hear this, the Black Lives Matter movement, because the founding father of the British Museum, where quite a lot of um, the Parthenon sculptures currently reside, he made his money from slavery. And um, this is a major issue for Cambridge University. As you know, there's a, um, a the actual VC is having a, a little bit of a discussion about what we should do in terms of any objects or anything about the university that might in any way be considered tainted by its association with the former slave trade. 
So at any rate, it wasn't actually for that reason that I got first involved, and I won't go into all the reasons, but I simply believe that with the museum now, the Acropolis Museum in Athens, having a very, very much better display of the Parthenon marbles that it has, it does seem to me time to um, give back what Lord Elgin, who was mentioned actually by Toby, and of course Lord Elgin seized his moment because uh, the British were in the favor of the Sultan of Turkey because we were enemies of Napoleon and Napoleon was an enemy of the Sultan. So my enemy's enemy is my friend. And it was therefore much easier for Elgin to grease the palms of the uh, court at uh, Istanbul and get permission, whatever permission he got. At any rate, he removed and in fact destroyed quite a bit of the Parthenon. But at any rate, that, that's in brief what lies behind my commitment to that notion of reunification. Thank you, Paul. Toby? Uh, I would just quote Jean-Francois Champollion again. Um, we cannot refrain from expressing a certain regret that this magnificent temple has been deprived of one of its finest monuments. Should we in France follow the example of Lord Elgin? Certainly not. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So we do have a question um, from Marigold N. Uh, did you, this is for you, Paul. Uh, did you come, come across anything that surprised you when researching Thebes? Something in, in particular, something forgotten? Was there something you were like, whoa? Okay, Marigold, former student of mine, <laughs> lovely to um, hear you and to be speaking with you. I'm so sorry I can't see you. At any rate, uh, just off the slides that I showed, I knew pretty much everything <laughs> before I started researching, with one exception, and that was the Pronomos bar. I did not know Pronomos was a Theban. So I knew the Pronomos vase was a, an Athenian artifact, that it depicted a theatrical scene uh, with a, an auletes, a man playing the aulos, whose name was Pronomos. I did not know before I started my research that he was a Theban. And then I thought, Gosh, you know, that really is a smack in the eye for the Athenians who uh, say the Boeotians are all swine. Well, actually, not all of them are. And here's one who's their best, they reckon the greatest current um, player of the Aulos at their Athenian plays. Very good. Elizabeth Marksteiner asks, Paul or Toby, um, do you have a question for each other? Well, I'm going to ask Paul a question to which I think I know the answer, but I'd like him to confirm it, which is I, I have a sneaking suspicion that the earliest textual reference to Boeotian Thebes is from Egyptian Thebes uh, on an inscription of Pharaoh Amenhotep III from his mortuary <laughs> temple in Western Thebes, which seems to record the itinerary of a diplomatic mission sent by the Egyptian Pharaoh to the Mediterranean in about 1360 BC. And amongst the many places it lists, Knossos and Mycenae, uh, Boeotian Thebes is one of them. Am I right in thinking, Paul, that is the, ironically, the earliest reference to your Thebes is from my Thebes? You put it so succinctly and elegantly, Toby, the answer in one word is yes. And it's, ah. in, and it's in the book. So um, I have to recognize this. It, it took me quite a while wrestling with the fact that Homer, which is, as I said, the earliest Greek source, some people think some of Homer actually goes back to about that period that you've just described in Egyptian prehistory or history. But whether or not it does, Homer mentions both Egyptian Thebes and Greek Thebes. And this is really irritating for, for me because of course, in some ways, the Egyptian one won out. But then I wanted to know why was it that, and I, I said this in my little talk, why do we refer to your Thebes by its Greek name? Why don't we refer to it by its Egyptian name? And so that's my question to you. Why did the Greek word Thebes come to drive out whatever the Egyptian, most appropriate Egyptian term for the Luxor Valley of Kings area would have been in ancient Egyptian times? Uh, it, it happened all, all over Egypt. So most of the, the names by which we know Egyptian uh, cities today, ancient Egyptian cities, Memphis, uh, uh, Heliopolis, uh, Crocodilopolis, they're all Greek names. 
uh, yeah. partly because, of course, the, the, the Greeks or the Greek speaking peoples um, uh, invaded Egypt and, and, and the court started to speak Greek. But largely, I suspect, because we in the West are the inheritors of, of Greek uh, scholarship. Yes, um, and yes. certainly the early Egyptologists would all have been versed in the classical languages and so adopted the terminology, the nomenclature that the Greeks and, and Greek speaking writers had used. And so, alas, we don't call it Waset um, and we don't call it en in Ebu Hedge. It's yeah. Thebes and Memphis. <laughs> I'm very I think, that's one, I think that's one all to, to Egypt and, and Greece, if I may say so. We get it. We're fighting back. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Toby, a, 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 qu a question for you is, so this 200th anniversary is coming up um, uh, beneath the sands. Um, occasionally there are tantalizing uh, things in the papers about things that may be behind walls here and there that, they, that, that they're trying to discover. What, what's the next hundred years for Egyptology? Well, the whole of Egypt is an archeological site. I mean, you, you cannot put a spade in the ground anywhere in Egypt without hitting antiquities. Um, for me, um, okay, it would be wonderful to, to discover the final undiscovered tomb in the Valley of the Kings, if there is such a thing. But actually for me, I would love to uncover uh, some more of the, the domestic dwellings of the ancient Egyptians. We have a, a couple of settlements, but they're rather um, atypical settlements. And actually, if we really want to know what life was like in ancient Egypt, we need to uncover settlements, not, not tombs. Tombs tell us what death was like in ancient Egypt, but they don't tell us much about what life was like. I could add that they also corroborate the view that the Egyptians, ancient Egyptians, pre-Greek ancient Egyptians seem to have been unnaturally almost, but certainly very strongly preoccupied with death. I mean, is that a false impression created by the fact that their artifacts survive, their death-related artifacts survive? You're absolutely right, Paul. It's because the, the tombs, which were always located on the low desert, where it, the preservation was better, have survived. Their, their cities, towns and villages lie under Egypt's modern cities, towns and villages. So we have a very distorted picture of ancient Egypt. Thanks. So a, a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, Paul, if you visit Thebes today, what can you see? Well, you see a modern town because um, just as Toby has said, and just as Sparta, in the 1830s was built smack bang on top of ancient Sparta. So modern Thebes overlies ancient Thebes. How did they find the palace that I started off from? Well, they were digging gas mains. I mean, that's how you find out about ancient Thebes, uh, by modern urban renewal or development. And it's a bit like the city of London. There have been amazing finds there recently with the terrific development of offices. Um, this is now going to look like something from ancient history, I think, offices. Um, we're not going back, are we? Or we're going to try not to go back to too many offices. At any rate, um, it's simply the case that um, modern Thebes overlies ancient, therefore one gets spotty uh, kinds of um, access to particular shrines, uh, a new house or a new um, shopping area, whatever's being built, and um, th that's it. It's what's called rescue archaeology. It goes back to the 19th century archaeology when, of course, there were many fewer people, but Thebes now, part of modern Greece, easily accessible from Athens and in a very fertile area. There's lots of water, which is not so common in Athens, so lots of water is um, regularly um, drained off down the Mornas Dam project, which goes to um, give water to the five million or so who live in the greater Athens area. Thebes itself is just a few um, tens of thousands, which is quite typical for a provincial Greek city or town today. That question was um, from Francis Jacobs, and also a question for you, Toby, as well. Um, you mentioned the British, French, and German Egyptologists. Uh, I, there were some Italians. And uh, do, do you touch on them in your book as well? Uh, I do. There, there are also many Americans, of course, and, and an entire chapter of the book is devoted to America and Egypt. And that's a fascinating story, which starts much earlier than you might think, actually, um, way back in the 18, uh, 1830s. Um, 
the Italians never quite got it together because it, by the time Italian unification uh, had happened and the Italian state in its current form was able to sponsor archaeological digs, they, they kind of rather lost all the plum sites to, to the British, French, Germans and, and Americans. There were a few uh, notable early um, Tuscan uh, uh, and um, Sardinian sponsored excavations uh, in, in Egypt uh, way, way back in, in, in the early 19th century. But uh, yeah, they, they, they slightly lost out. And then um, uh, and I guess they had, you know, they had their other adventures in, in Africa to, to contend with, which would rather drew them away from, from Egypt. Well, thank you. Well, those were the some questions that we had come in, and we're now at uh, six ten, so we've we've run a little bit over. Um, but this was a fabulous uh, uh, occasion, um, not the event we all wanted, and I hope we will will meet again in person before too long. But I'm so pleased uh, that you could both be here tonight, and on behalf of everybody watching, applause from all. <laughs> Jazz and, hands. <laughs> and and this is exact and this is on uh, YouTube, and as is the, uh, the rest of the program this week, um, for people who just want to tune in or watch again. Um, but we have uh, more events tomorrow, right through Saturday morning, and I hope you enjoy them and get to see some familiar faces and uh, continue to have really good questions and engage. Um, while, while we are all locked in, this is a great opportunity to. Um, engage with each other and connect and and think and so I'm really grateful to you both. Thank so you Bill, wonderful well, to be here. And same from me, cheers. Cheers everybody.